Kia ora and welcome to Cultured Conversations. My name is Kirsten Lacey and I am the director at Auckland Art Gallery Toyo Tamaki. Today, an international conversation with Ian Williamson, the Pro Vice Chancellor at the Wellington School of Business and Government at Victoria University in Wellington. Welcome, Ian. Ian, you're an international leader in spheres of business, entrepreneurship, governance and indigeneity, cross-cultural exchange. But we met at the Melbourne Business School where I was your student. I'm a little bit nervous to talk to you again today and to be with you, uh, my professor, from all those years ago. Equally excited because you've got so much to offer this conversation, Ian. How do you see COVID and the COVID moment? Well, obviously, the first and foremost thing around COVID, well, I should start off by saying that the tables have turned. So now I'm being interviewed by one of my students. I actually feel the, the nervousness you probably felt when I was asking you questions in class. <laughs> so I guess it's payback time. But um, I think we should just start off with appreciating that the, the number one issue with COVID is the health and safety concerns. And so you, you've had, uh, you know, so many lives impacted by it. Um, and that ultimately will be the cost that all of our societies will will bear um, that 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 lost those lost family members and friends and then what it's also done i think because of that has generated a, a in, in many respects a sensitivity to some of the fragile fragilities that we have in our society um, and that and it's exposing some of those cracks that were were likely already there so in, in those societies where there was low levels of trust with our institutions, obviously that's become a bigger issue. In those societies where we had huge discrepancies between accesses and resources uh, between different types of communities, that's become a bigger issue. In those areas where we have had a lack of understanding or knowledge or education, obviously a bigger story as well. So I think it's, it's exposing some things that were there. Um, and then as a result, the, the leadership challenge becomes quite clear around how do we um, first and foremost ensure that we have a safe environment, but also begin to bring together or bridge those various divides uh, that are being really clearly ar articulated right now. Mm. I was talking with Andrew Grant, who works with McKinsey's, and he was gave me an, a, a model for the economy right now, and he described mm. it as a K, where you've got some people really, really thriving at this point, um, economically and in their business life while others are just tanking and mm. of course with that exactly what you're saying uh, it becomes a major cultural phenomenon for us because we've got a, an ever-increasing divide with a cultural overlay to it how do we do this how, how are we going to move through this well, I think it's it's multiple levels. Um, I think what you have to first think about is do people feel they have the opportunity to participate? We're we're social creatures, right? And we have to understand that we we define ourselves through our interactions with others. And if there's no opportunity to participate in the, the institutions, the activities that we we're, we're have as a society, then people quickly alienate themselves, and and that becomes a big challenge. So what is going to be the way in which we participate in government? What is going to be the way in which we participate in the conversations with our economy? What is going to be the way we participate with our cultural institutions? And COVID, of course, is particularly challenging because it actually makes it hard for us to interact. It makes it hard for us to communicate in the way we're used to. So the leadership you know, for me would be, first and foremost, making sure we create those channels, despite the fact that we can't normally congregate in the way that we normally would, for individuals to feel like they're part of the conversation. And I think when you look at the economic aspect of it, um, as we look at increases in unemployment, as we think about businesses failing, you know, people are gonna feel like they don't have a voice. Um, and, and, and as a result, they're not gonna feel like they have ability to shape their destiny or have an impact on what's going on around them. And that is ultimately the most destabilizing thing we could ever see in the community. So that's, that would be number one for me. And, and I think just reflecting on my experiences here at the university as I as a member of the leadership team here, trying to lead our organization through this challenge. That's certainly been, when we've done it well, it's because we've created that space of voice, we've educated people, we've made them part of the conversation. And when we struggled, it's because uh, we didn't do that. And, you know, and we had to learn that lesson the hard way. So creating channels to enable voice is what I heard mm. you say, uh, as being critical 
not just for enabling equity of access, but for the university itself. Yeah. Yeah, I think for us, you know, our, our moment in time right now should be thinking, how can we as an institution become that platform? You know, educational institutions have always had a very unique and I think trusted space in society. It's the place where everybody from any background can come and they can have a conversation about ideas. And we talk oftentimes about academic freedom and the like, but really what that is is an agreed upon principle that we're going to create a safe space for us to talk about challenging ideas, right? For all points and views to be considered equally, we're all seats at the table. And, and when we do that, that's when we make a big contribution to society. So now we're at a moment in time where, you know, many people are going to be questioning that. Many people are going to be questioning whether or not they have the right skills to participate in the conversation. Will they get uh, legitimized? Will their point of view be put forth? This is, this is where universities should shine. This is where we really begun. I think the investments that society makes in universities, you would hope to see that society begins to get those returns because they need a space like that. How do we make sense of something that nobody really understands? And this is where universities should shine. You said all seated at the table, mm -hmm. which touches on governance in a whole range of spheres, not just at the university, but in business, cultural sector, institutions, business. Is everyone all seated at the table, Ian? Well, I think the, the world around us has shown over the last several months that clearly that's not the case, um, that, you know, we can look no further than the Black Lives Matter movement that we've seen, which starts off in America, but quickly I, I became global. I mean, I, I, I find it just really amazing to me that I attended a Black Lives uh, Matter rally in front of the Capitol here in Wellington several months ago. And, you know, here I am, uh, a black kid from the south side of Chicago in Wellington, New Zealand, on the other side of the planet attending a rally with thousands of individuals. And it just dawned on me, you know, these individuals have never really been to where I've been. Um, I was one of the very few uh, black people that were actually there, and certainly one of the very few black African Americans that were there. And yet there was a commonality of understanding about that experience. And also just um, the feeling of the need to have that protest, that rally to legitimize that experience. Right. You don't need to do those things if you're already sitting at the table. That's that's a that's a telltale sign that there's there's not a sense of voice. So we have that. Um, and, and it's not necessarily new. I mean, these are challenges that we've had uh, before, uh, but it, it really is becoming. You feel like they're equally participating or more importantly, that their voice, their experience, their culture is being legitimated. And that's critical. You know, and, and here in New Zealand, um, you know, we can look at the history of the Maori and Pacifica people to understand what that experience would look like and, and the many efforts. Um, I'm reflecting on the fact that we just had uh, Te Reo Maori Week last week and, you know, just the importance of those types of things in society to begin to bring to fold that contribution that that community makes to our, our country. Mm. You've worked in America, Australia, Indonesia and New Zealand. Yes. And now you're about to go home. Mm. Um, but just reflecting on your experiences in those different countries with respect to this question about governance and equity. Yeah, it's, it's been a particular interest and passion of mine for probably all of my professional life. And, you know, if, I, if you ask me what's my goal as an educator, it's to increase access to a world-class education. And, and that first part really starts off with the reason why I'm focusing on increasing access is because I don't think that there's access. Um, I think there's challenges about accessibility. And, you know, interesting enough, uh, wherever I've worked, one of the things I've always had is projects that were really sort of walking into a room and saying, let me understand who's here. And then let me spend more of my time thinking about who's not here. So who's not in a room? And when I arrived in Australia, you know, I was very excited to be coming to this new culture and this new society and was really well received. And, you know, spent some time trying to learn the people that I was meeting, but then quite quickly realized, wait a second, there's a whole group of people that are never here. Um, for example, the Aboriginal Torres Strait Island people. Why aren't they in the room? What am I missing? What, what could they contribute to this conversation? And that led to a whole host of activities around supporting uh, indigenous entrepreneurship in Australia. We've had a very successful program now for over 10 years called the Murrah Program, mm. really working with nationally uh, indigenous entrepreneurs to find ways to increase the success of their businesses, which generates income, which generates employment, which generates wealth, 
as well as self-determination within those communities. And it legitimizes that experience of how you bring together that culture with the economic model. Uh, when I was in Indonesia, uh, it was a very similar story, beginning to work with Indonesian entrepreneurs to think about how can they participate more fully in what's going on in this broader economy. So you have this country of 240 million individuals um, that's really, I think, staged well to be a leader in the world, the fourth largest country on the planet. Yet you have a lot of individuals who are still making their way through understanding what does economic participation look like. And so I was able to work with entrepreneurs in that country to understand what that experience was like. And even here, since I've joined uh, Victoria University of Wellington, beginning to develop some programs around developing future leaders in the Maori space. And so that's always been a particular passion of mine. It was something I was doing and focusing on in the U.S. and certainly will be a focus of mine when I go back to the U.S. in, in terms of understanding how we empower uh, Latinx community or African-American community to be much more present, particularly in like areas of digital economy. You're a teacher, Ian, but can you share with me what you've learned from Maori leaders here during your time in New Zealand mm. about leadership? Well, I think it's been an unbelievable experience for me to be exposed and, and you know, really have some really great interactions with that community. And I just have thanked all the members of that community who've been able to taken the time to kind of share with me their culture and you know one of the more most important phrases that you oftentimes hear and and i won't use the trail because mine is not so good but it is the phrase around what is the most important thing the people the people the people and flow on from that especially with some of the work that i've been doing with some of the ewe organizations is a really clear understanding that the, the whole purpose of economic activity is to reinforce to uh, ensure survival of culture Right, really, that is the essence of the people. And the economic activity is just a byproduct of that. It's the thing we do to uh, share our culture, to, to reinvest in our culture, to enrich our culture. And if you think about an economy as a mechanism to uh, shape, legitimate, and reinforce culture, it really changes the way you think about what you want to do in that economy and how you want to participate. And that's something I've taken. I've really taken a lot from my interactions with EWE organizations, the, the perspective of time. You can, you can think about you know, 100 year business plans if you appreciate that the thing that will translate over that 100 years is not you as an individual. You, know, you, won't, you won't be working in that company for 100 years. And in fact, when I did my first engagement with the EWE organization and they said, okay, talk to me about how this is gonna impact my great grandchildren. That's when I knew I was in a different environment. That wasn't the conversation I was having with the ASX 200 firms I was working with in Australia. Um, and that becomes, because what they're thinking through is what is it that I'm passing down? I'm not passing down money. I'm passing down a way of doing things. I'm passing, and the money enables us to do the things that we desire. It's not the other way around. Mm. Mm. So true. And will you be taking these learning i mean you're going back to america your country's kind of on fire at the moment it's a strange yeah. decision california uh, actually literally is on fire at the moment <laughs> unfortunately you know what what will you take with you in your teachings from aotearoa well i think it's going to be a, a interesting blend of um one reconnecting you know with my my home culture, my, my, my community, um, and then opening doors to them, for them, those who haven't had the, some of the opportunities I've had, to think about what, what this means globally. Um, it's, it's been quite amazing to me to, to see, um, quite frankly, that I've been able to do what I've been able to do. You know, never in my wildest imaginations would I have thought growing up where I grew up and that I'd be doing work with these different communities, or more importantly, that these communities would be embracing me and finding value in what I can bring. And so there's this, I hope to play a bridge role between uh, Aotearoa, Australia, Indonesia, other places to African-American community, to um, Latinx community. I mean, to begin to see that there's some commonality of experiences, that there's some, there's some opportunities for exchanges, which naturally will have economic components to it, but I think are much bigger that most of us would not normally have thought of. We wouldn't normally have thought to pick up the phone and call these people or consider them when we're looking for people to do work with. Mm. So I, I wanna help normalize that, to mm. set that aspiration. You know, I oftentimes tell my students, my job is to give you a world-class education, but it really doesn't matter if I give you a world-class education if you set your sights on something that's not global. When I was 
talking with Chelsea Wynn Stanley, who's a Māori filmmaker who's been based in LA, and she's come over to make a feature film with us. And I asked her, she'd just left LA, you know, in the midst of these riots, and I asked her about it, and she said, yeah, look, I support the movement, of course, but I'm wondering where the Native American spirit is yeah. within it. Do you have anything to reflect on that question that she put? I think it's a great observation to make. Um, you know, I've, I've for years, for almost 20 years now, have been involved in an organization uh, called the PhD Project. And the goal of that organization is to support the uh, increase, basically, the number of uh, African American, Latino, Latina, as well as uh, Native American First Nations uh, professors in business. And certainly, um, there's been some great successes across all three communities. But I will say, in talking with um, in my, my colleagues, indigenous colleagues from America, the challenges in that community, the lack of representation, particularly in the economic space, is huge. Mm. And so that's a, that's a story that really um, has to be told more. And I think a lot more time and energy has to be placed on it. One of the things we were really excited about um, and have still continued to do work around was using the program we developed in Australia and some of the work we're doing here to really think about how we can develop an international form around indigenous economic activity. So we've had discussions with U.S. partners, Canadian partners, obviously here in Aotearoa, as well as in Australia. And, you know, we've had conferences that brought these, all, these individuals all together. And you just see that there's a huge opportunity here because of a cultural connection for some really deep and long-lasting exchanges. Mm. You said to me when we were talking previously, Ian, that to bring indigeneity into the mainstream of business systems was when we would know we'd seen real change. Yeah. Can you unpack that a little bit further and what would that look like? Well, I think it's, it's if I think about my university, right, and I'll just talk on, on that and maybe use that as an example. Um, what I'm always looking for is um, how, how, how are the values, cultures, norms, routines, expectations, uh, aspirations of a society reflected in what we do? So, you know, how have we normalized that to say that's part of our repertoire? Some of that might be the language. Some of that might be the types of activities. And I'll give you a simple example. So we have a business school. We have a large accounting program. Historically, it's produced a lot of accounting students. We send them out to all these accounting firms. You know, and I, and I reflect on the fact that when I get an 18-year-old or 17-year-old that shows up at my door, very few of them say, you know what I want to do? I want to go up and be an accountant, and I want to work for fill-in-a-blank company. That's just not on their radar. Mm -hmm. And then three years later, they're telling me the number one thing I want to do in my life is I want to be an accountant and I want to go work. And I go, where did that come from? Part of that came from us as an institution. We normalized and socialized and said, this is a legitimate expectation for what you should be doing. And that's great. But by the same token, if I'm, if I'm appreciating the, the power that we have as an institution to do that, I have to also understand, well, how come I'm not having kids when they're finishing up saying, what I really, really want to do is I want to go work for this EWI organization because that's going to be the thing that really drives, how can I ensure that all those pathways are seen as equally legitimate, equally viable, and I'm giving space, right? So one of the reasons why the kids think very much about working for these big accounting firms is when we have guest speakers, we bring who are we partners from these big accounting firms? And they get in front and we've legitimized and saying, this is something that we think is successful. Why should I not also be doing the same thing with general managers of EWI organizations or, or Pacifica business leaders or representatives from government? Because that way people have a perspective to say, you know, I can use my talent in a lot of ways. I don't have to just limit it. And, and I think that's the test for every organization. When a person walks in that organization, do they see a part of themselves in what you're trying to accomplish? And if not, what you're asking them to do is to set a part of themselves aside while they're there. Mm. And that's never going to be the type of success we want from a person. Mm. So true. And in terms of thinking about how we set out to do this, I mean, I'm the leader of a really important cultural institution here mm. in Aotearoa as an Australian Pakaha woman. Uh, it's always top of mind how we set out in these challenges, right? And then we have the COVID context. Mm. Do you think there's something within the COVID years that we have ahead of us that 
will assist this struggle and this work? Hmm. Well, I mean, I think there will be some necessities that come out of COVID that will just force us to do things in a, and it will challenge some of the assumptions that we already had. Um, I think it will make more clear the interdependencies that we have. So that will just become a lot more frank and more straightforward. I think it's going to open up some doors for many communities that perhaps had never thought about digital technologies as a way to reinforce and connect. Um, I think it's, it's really interesting. You have a lot of communities, if I think about Maori community, Pacifica community, and the like in other spaces, which historically have been underrepresented in the information technology space. Mm -hmm. You know, only, I think it's only 2.3% of all the information technology workers in this country are Maori, right? And so you, you look at that and you're gonna, that community is gonna say, we're not gonna be able to do the things we wanna do if we don't get our head around digital technology. And all of a sudden there's gonna be a push for more individuals in that community to really understand what the heck this is that we're spending all our days on all the time. And then how do we contribute to it? And that's a good thing. And then we as, you know, as an educator or other institutions need to be saying, that's the opportunity for us. You know, I was looking at some recent work around digital divide here in Aotearoa. It's, you know, almost 15% of the population doesn't have consistent access to high speed internet. Mm. You know, you just think about, this is a highly sophisticated, well-developed, you know, very technologically savvy society. Yet you have a huge portion of the people that don't have that. Mm. So COVID is gonna force us to deal with that. Mm. You know, wh whether we like it or not, we as a society can't allow that to go forward anymore. It will cause all of us tremendous pain. I was with a Māori family a couple of weekends ago up north on their country property. Uh, there was a lot of people, uh, people around. It was a big ceremonial day and I was the only Pākehā non Toreo speaker in the house and it, it was a very special day and privilege to be there. But the father of this family chose not to have access to Wi-Fi for his whanau at home. And there were a lot of young people and children and, and the elderly, all ages, uh, congregated for this very special weekend of ceremony, waiata and song and haka. And there was no interruption of digital device mm. you know and I kind of use that word deliberately because that's really how he he framed it when I was relaying that story to a another uh, Pakaha leader on return there was a sense of that being a kind of isolationist approach to mm. Fanu leadership which I also felt problematic in its kind of judgment as well. Do you have a perspective though on this? I mean, you're talking about um, equity of access to digital technologies. I guess it's different when you think about a designated deliberate choice about turning that switch off. Yeah, well, I mean, I think one of the things we also have to always have to appreciate is all of us, and, and, and I think we can think about it individually or even collectively, have the right and privilege to, to choose how we engage, right? So uh, I think we always need to respect the fact that all of us as human beings have the, the right to determine the, the nature of our engagement. So um, if, a, if, a, if an individual makes that choice, well, that's on them to do. But what I would say is what becomes more challenging for me is when the choice is made for you. Right, so I'm probably not going to have a big issue around somebody making a choice as to be more or less engaged around digital technology, social media and the like. But what I will say is where it becomes a little bit more disturbing for me is when those choices are made for segments of society mm. and when they are not actually reflected in those mediums. Yeah. Right, because the individuals who are then using those meetings begin to either not, not just not believe those people exist or develop very, you know, skewed perspectives of it. So what I would say is, well, you know, uh, like every tool, uh, and again, I guess I'm an educator, so maybe I would think this way, is I would say, well, my job is to sort of present this tool to you, educate you about how you would use it, what it would be useful for. But my job is not to impose a values based on you. 
Mm. Right. Because you get to choose what you use the tool for. That's that's the that's the beauty of being human. Like that's the an essence of choice. Right. Mm -hmm. And so um, if you have that choice and you choose to use it or not use it, well, that's on you. But if the choice is being made for you, um, then I would go, well, systematically, what's going to happen is you're going to lose out the ability to be able to define the evolution of that too. Mm -hmm. And that's why I think it becomes really, really challenging mm -hmm. because now you have something that is being used. And in some cases, it's actually being used against you or it's just, you know, you're being, um, you're being restricted in what you can do. Mm -hmm. When you're consulting with business in um, thinking about access and uh, cultural diversity, what advice do you give them about why they should be playing in this space to succeed? Yeah, I, I think it's, I think it's first and foremost, if I just had to have a very basic, broad statement, organizations exist because they provide some sense of value to a community. Right. And people forget that they have their company and they have their goal and the entrepreneur, or the leaders. And it's like, yeah, yeah, that's great what you're trying to do. But it only really matters if it matters to the community you're serving. Right. So let's take, take a step back from your organization and just say, what does this community need? What do they want? And those organizations that ultimately solve the biggest needs of society are the ones that get rewarded by society. And those organizations that do not provide something that society values or community values, um, no matter how much you try to market, at some point they're going to say, we don't want you anymore, and they get rid of you, and you will fail. And so if you just start with that embracing that, this, that notion of embeddedness, that you are actually interdependent and actually dependent on this community, then the, the question becomes, well, who's in it? Mm -hmm. And if you tell me you want to grow and you tell me you want to be successful and you want to be you know, relevant, then you know probably in there somewhere is to understand who these people are and what they want and what their major challenges are mm -hmm. and in most cases the, the the failure of growth is typically associated with failure to truly try to take on the needs of all the members of that community mm -hmm. so you you know if i was a telecom company and i was trying to figure out ways to expand my businesses here and i you know i had a great internet product and everything i would go well i'm going to go to auckland and i'm going to try to get market share versus all these other providers i'm like yeah that's great but i got 15 percent of the country none of which are in auckland that don't have internet access you might want to think about that as a market yeah. Right. Like that makes a little more sense to me. And they would go, but that's challenging. I would go with well, the organizations that deal with the most complex challenges mm -hmm. through innovation are the ones that always succeed. Right. So you're never going to be successful without the hard work. But taking on the big problems ultimately has the bigger return. So the organizations that tackle the most difficult problems to market always succeed is that that's what you said right yeah yeah okay you can you can convince me to try to take something that solves a small part of my life's problem over and over again but at the end of the day success and survival and i'm not thinking about like one term is ultimately the societies will always do a audit and they will say do i need you do i not need you so when i could talk to you all day but i just wanted to touch on one more thing which was the work you've done around creativity and the mm. creative mind or innovation, you know, maybe they're not the same thing. Um, <laughs> but creativity in that challenge, you know, yeah. because, I mean, I work in the arts and we, our bus core business is ideas and mm. ideas that find form, find visual visual form or form within a gallery context, I guess. Um, we work with the creative thinkers and poets and philosophers of our time, you know. But as, institu as an institution and, and institutions all over the world, we're, we're fairly sluggish and, and not necessarily creative or innovative in our business approaches or corporate structures or, you know, all those kinds of things. So I look to your insights in business around this, I guess, um, in terms of creativity. How do organisations empower the creativity within their people to rise yeah. to that challenge you've identified? So I have three kids, 
And my children are very big readers. And for a time, they were going through a phase where they said they wanted to be writers. And my knee-jerk reaction was like, oh, <laughs> that's, you may be living here for a while. You know, like, is there any money in that? But then I, re I actually had to challenge myself, and I thought about it. And I said, you know, we've talked so much about disruption over the last 10 years. And we've talked about all the careers and all the various jobs are going to be automated and the robots are coming and all these various things. And I had to reflect and I said, you know, one of the things that I've noticed is that every society since the, since the recorded history has had storytellers. And, and great storytellers in every society throughout history have always been championed. We know their names, right? We know the names of these people that literally thousands of years ago were telling stories. And whether it was oral, whether it was on a, a wall, whether it was on a scroll, whether it was on a book, whether it was on a television, now whether it's on a screen, it's great storytelling, the, the bringing to work expression of the experience of the human condition, that is a recession-proof setting. The demand is all, and it's interesting, as we've had more and more channels to share stories, you know, whether it be on our phone, our laptop, our television, or whatever, uh, the demand has increased. I don't think we have a, I don't think we as human beings have a limit as to how much we would want that. So uh, this is one of the reasons why I'm a big believer in the creative economy, because it goes back to one of the things I said earlier, that ultimately the, the economic activity is a mechanism to facilitate culture. Like we do that because we're trying to reinforce, reinvest in, in established culture. So I think arts uh, broadly defined right, is a manifestation of that. And I, and I think this is where, you know, the story, the storytelling, the creation, the art, all of those things are, are we just love that stuff. We, we, we can't get enough of it. So then it becomes a matter of how do you create business models around it so that you can do it, we, we can do it in a sustainable way, hmm. right? And so part of that is gaining control over your story, right, and being able to think about how you position it. Part of it is thinking wisely about how you communicate it. So oftentimes, you know, we have a new entrepreneurship program here at our university. And one of the things I've told everyone is that, you know, be great to get some business students taking that program, but I really want the musicians. I want the artists. I want, because whether they know it or not, they're all entrepreneurs. Mm, absolutely. Right? And, the sooner, <laughs> and the sooner they figure that out, the better they're gonna be, yeah. right? The writers. How do you gain control over how your story is told, how it is used, and, and how you manage the channels? Because that's ultimately just a business model, mm, right? Yeah. And, you know, we don't normally think of it that way, but that's actually what it is. So I, I actually think it's a, and I actually think it's a wonderful opportunity for a country like, uh, like Aotearoa. I think, you know, how do you contribute to this global conversation without traveling all around the world, given this remote location? Our storytelling, you know. So it's, true, so true. Yeah. Hey, Ian, it's been just such a pleasure talking to you and I can't wait to bring exhibitions from Aotearoa, New Zealand and the Auckland Art Gallery to your home in the States. Maybe we even, would love to have you. Maybe even Chicago, you never know. That would um, be great. Um, let's stay in touch and keep this conversation going as you make that big move back home to your whānau uh, in the States. You've been listening to Cultured Conversations with Kirsten Lacey and Ian Williamson. Um, thank you for joining us and please keep the conversation going on culture, whatever industry you may be working in.